Coming up, the real gladiators who fought to the bloody death in ancient Rome. They were the damned of the Roman world, considered the lowest form of humanity. They're the scum of society. They're foreigners, prisoners, war, rebel slaves. But a few became star athletes and even sex symbols. Gladiators are significant figures in society. They don't see the crowd as their enemies. They're their fans. For centuries, the gladiators of Rome served as raw material for a vast entertainment industry, a blood sport that cost thousands of human lives. Gladiators are now portrayed in movies and books as courageous martyrs who face their own slaughter with dignity. Who were these warriors, and why did they fight to the death for the pleasure of the Roman crowds? Join us for the true story of gladiators. London, 1996. Archaeologists working in the Southwark district along the River Thames make a remarkable discovery. A Roman-era cemetery from the first century AD occupies a city block in the middle of the industrial waterfront. One grave, that of a young woman, contains a number of objects interred with the dead. Among them is a small oil lamp bearing the figure of a fallen gladiator. Other objects bear gladiatorial symbols or gods associated with the games. I think the gladiator was very much like the modern sports figure. They were well known in their area. They were quite well compensated. They were popular heroes. Uh, they are indeed the Michael Jordans of their time. The artifacts indeed attest to the enormous popularity of gladiators in Roman society even in a remote outpost such as ancient Londonium. Remarkable all the more, for gladiators were first considered pariahs in the Roman world. Who were these ancient warriors who fought and died for the amusement of others? And how did they become such influential figures in Roman society? It begins in the mist-shrouded years of the early Roman state in the 7th century BC. Rome is dominated by the Etruscans, a powerful people from the part of Italy known today as Tuscany. They are believed to be the first to expose the Romans to gladiatorial combat. The evidence for this comes from tomb paintings in Etruria, which is a region not too far distant to the north of Rome. We have in these tomb paintings representations of bloody spectacles. So some suggest that these were funeral games for the Etruscans and that the Romans, who took a lot of their symbols of power from the Etruscans, uh, adopted it from them. In 509 BC, the Romans break free of Etruscan rule and form their own republic. They soon set out to conquer their neighbors. In wars with the Samnites and the Greeks of southern Italy, they encounter new and distinct styles of fighting. The Samnite Wars were in many ways decisive in the history of gladiatorial combat in Italy because it was among the Samnites that gladiators had originated. There's even a specific incident mentioned by the historian Livy, uh, dated in 308 BC, where the Romans and the Campanians were fighting against uh, their foes, the Samnite peoples of South Central Italy. And after a battle, the local Campanians took some of the captives and forced them to fight against each other. The Romans, always swift to adapt foreign customs and technology, take up the practice of forcing prisoners into combat at funerals. They call these events munera. The word itself, munis, munera is the plural, means duty or obligation. Most people think that since the first gladiatorial combats in Rome were associated with public funerals, that this duty or obligation was something owed the deceased. As the warring Romans come to dominate the Italian peninsula, they incorporate the arms and tactics of their defeated enemies for use in the Munera. Many styles of gladiatorial combat develop, each with its own unique weapons and armatures. The Thracian with his curved sword, the Samnite armored with a large shield and visored helmet, 
the Murmilo, whose helmet is adorned with a distinctive fish-shaped crest. One of the most famous types of gladiators was the Retiarius, or the net man who fought with a trident in a net. Other gladiators would fight with daggers. There's some evidence for early gladiators fighting with spears. The term gladiator originates from the short Roman sword known as the gladius. Meant for stabbing more than slashing, it is the classic weapon of the Roman legions. And so, uh, by derivation, a gladiator is someone who uses a sword, a swordsman. But beyond that, there's a tremendous amount of confusion about the way the word is used. And in fact, it's used uh, very broadly and loosely in ancient times. Initially, it is the Roman armies at their encampments on the frontiers who force prisoners to fight in Munera. These contests reinforce the traditional Roman values of victory at all costs and death before dishonor. Surrender is reviled, and so the prisoner who becomes a gladiator is vilified in the Roman mind. They're a military nation, and they're impressed by the, the skills and the virtue, the courage of the gladiators, but that's discordant with who these people are, especially in the early years. They're the scum of society. They're foreigners, prisoners of war, rebel slaves. The Munera would finally be brought to Rome itself, but for a very different reason. We've got a situation where uh, noble families want to impress uh, voters by putting on uh, displays of conspicuous consumption of some sort. In 264 BC, as part of the funeral honors of Junius Brutus Pera, a descendant of one of the founders of the Roman Republic, the first gladiatorial games are held in Rome. Instead of the usual amusements, such as chariot races or wild animal hunts, three pairs of gladiators are scheduled to fight in the Forum Boarium, the city's cattle market. It was a pretty modest um, affair overall, and I suspect that was sort of a trial balloon to see if, if there was a market for this sort of thing. It is the Roman citizens' first taste of gladiatorial blood, a thirst which would not be quenched for over 700 years. The first gladiatorial games at Rome in 264 BC take place at a time when the young republic faces its greatest military challenge, the Punic Wars. This series of wars against Rome's North African rival Carthage span more than a hundred years and include the invasion of Italy by Hannibal and his elephants. As the legions lose battles on the frontiers, Roman leaders try to boost morale by increasing the size and frequency of gladiatorial games. I think the Romans found gladiatorial combat uh, something of a demonstration of what they like to think about themselves as people. Uh, that in some ways it was a, an example of the Roman spirit in its very essence. But the gladiatorial games also serve another purpose for the expanding Roman state, propaganda. One of the points of using prisoners of war is to enable the people in the inner part of the empire to get a, a sense of what's going on in the outside of the empire. There's no TV. How do you know what a German barbarian actually looks like unless you've seen the prisoners fighting for you in Rome? To feed the growing demand for skilled combatants in the city, Gladiatorial schools are established outside Rome. The school is part prison, part training facility. We have the remains of many gladiatorial training grounds, of which perhaps the best preserved is in Pompeii, and it looks very much like a gymnasium. There's a large open central area where the gladiators would train. We know that gladiators were trained by specialists in the kinds of arm that they decided to use. Gladiatorial trainers called the Nistas procure their human chattel from local slave markets or criminal courts. These slaves are rigorously trained in the arts of killing. Physical conditioning is constant and brutal. But equally important is, is what one might call the mental conditioning. They have to be programmed to fight in a certain way and to uphold the code, the sort of ethical standards of being a gladiator to fight with dignity, and to accept death, if necessary, with dignity. As an act of submission to his new master, the gladiator is made to swear an oath, the Sacramentum Gladiatorium. With it, he vows to endure being burned, bound in chains, beaten, and slain by the sword. Uri, vinciri, verberari, 
feroque necari patior. But the gladiatorial school is not necessarily a death sentence. By training a gladiator, the state offers him hope. Taking from a Roman mind essentially worthless people and conditioning them to believe that they can put on a good show and fight themselves to some sense of social redemption, that they can become, at least on the fringes, members of society again and ultimately win their freedom. One gladiator, however, chooses another path to freedom and becomes one of the greatest internal threats Rome would ever face. 73 BC, a Greek slave from the Roman province of Thrace is brought to the gladiatorial school at Capua. His name is Spartacus. Some sources, Appian and others, suggest he was a deserter from the Roman army. I have difficulty with that because if he was a deserter and then captured, he would have been killed uh, in all probability. Although enslaved, Spartacus is defiant and resists attempts to discipline him. The lanista, the trainer who was in charge of this, abused Spartacus by chaining them up, basically, not giving them enough freedom, not treating them decently. And so Spartacus and some 70 of his fellow gladiators break out of the school at Capua. They take refuge in the wild foothills around Mount Vesuvius. Other escaped slaves and malcontents soon join them, and Spartacus finds himself the leader of a vast rebel army. There must have been something about Spartacus that attracted people to him. It's very hard to know now. He really is nothing more than a name to us, recorded again by his enemies, an outrageous character who had dared challenge the majesty and order of the Roman state. Uh, but he did attract and maintain authority over some 70,000 people, we're told. At first, the Roman Senate does not take the rebellion seriously, judging Spartacus to be merely a brigand. But when he defeats the first two armies Rome sends against him, the Senate panics. And supposedly, the Senate was angry, too, that this slave should rebel against the Roman state, uh, that this shameful, contemptible kind of creature could have such su success against the Roman military machine. Meanwhile, Spartacus and his slave army are on the move, fighting their way north toward the Roman frontier with Gaul. His idea was to go beyond the Alps to a territory that was not governed by Rome at the time, and there maybe disperse his army. He was foiled, however, uh, in fulfilling this plan by his supporters, who apparently either for revenge or just for greed, uh, wanted to raid and pillage the rich countryside of Italy. So they turned back from the Alps. It would prove to be a fateful decision. The man the Senate finally chooses to deal with Spartacus is Marcus Licinius Crassus. A cunning politician and ruthless in business, he is also the wealthiest man in Rome. In fact, his full name, Marcus Licinius Crassus Dives, if one translated the latter part in English, is fatty rich guy. Though he has little military experience, he offers to pay a portion of the costs to field an army. He was also an ambitious man, uh, wanted to really make a prominent name for himself in Roman politics. And the best way to do that was through military command. In 71 BC, Crassus sets out with eight legions at his back. Although Spartacus has twice as many volunteers, Crassus's troops are well motivated. One small contingent of his army had a sort of a skirmish with Spartacus and didn't do well. And his response to this was to take the people who had fled the battlefield to line them up and decimate them, which means you go down every tenth one is killed by his fellows. And it was said that after he had done that, his army uh, was very obedient. The two forces finally meet on open ground in Lucania, south of Rome. Though they fight bravely, the rabble army of gladiators and slaves is no match for the iron discipline of Crassus's legions. So great was the slaughter, writes the Roman historian Appian, that it was impossible to count them. The ancient sources also record that Spartacus is killed in the battle. 
He charges into the midst of the foe, trying to reach Crassus on the other side of, of the battlefield. He kills two centurions who are fighting him at once, and he dies fighting. It's like something from the Alamo. To ensure that such a revolt never happens again, Crassus issues a brutal warning to the slaves of Rome. About 6,000 of the survivors of the Spartacan revolt were rounded up by Crassus and crucified on the Appian Way between Rome and Capua, where their gladiatorial school had been. Along the Via Appia, where once the wails of the dying could be heard for miles, there is now only the quiet whisper of the wind blowing through cypress trees. Rome, the eternal city, has entered the new millennium in peace and prosperity. But 2,000 years ago, within these ancient walls, the gladiatorial games would evolve into extravagant spectacles of death. As the Roman Republic matures in the first century BC, one of the greatest leaders of Roman history comes of age, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a genius on many levels, military, the writer, obviously politician, and so forth. Um, Julius Caesar would have been a good first emperor in the sense that he was totally qualified for it. An enthusiastic sponsor of gladiatorial games, Caesar is known to train his soldiers in gladiator-style combat. As a young man, he held the office of Edile, which is like a municipal magistrate. He put on spectacular games. He assembled so many gladiators, it's said that he had 320 pairs of gladiators himself, so much so that the Senate was getting nervous and tried to limit the amount of gladiators anyone could have. While fighting wars in Gaul and the Middle East, Caesar sends money back to Rome to sponsor a myriad of events designed to keep him in the public eye. Julius Caesar really was ahead of the curve in understanding the tremendous importance of this, that this was part of becoming as he would hoped, the first emperor of Rome. But it is Caesar's great triumphs, a series of parades and events held upon his return from North Africa in 46 BC, that would raise the bar for all future Roman spectacles. And these triumphs were bigger than any triumphs ever held before, with all sorts of parades and giveaways to the Roman populace, money being thrown in the streets, food, wine flowing, and all sorts of spectacle entertainments as well, from theater presentations to gladiatorial combats to full-scale staged battles in the Circus Maximus. There's so many people that showed up for these games, they went on for days after days, that the crush of the crowd actually killed people. On one day alone, a quarter of a million Romans packed the great chariot racing arena known as the Circus Maximus. Caesar provides a 1,000 foot soldiers, 60 horsemen, and 40 elephants to wage war for the cheering masses. Caesar is said to have taken out the central barrier so that his elephants and warriors could fight this mock battle after his triumph over North Africa. 30 elephants were killed, I think, in that encounter. Although Caesar's spectacles delight the Roman people, Certain senators see them as the poise of a power-mad dictator to convince the people to crown him emperor. On the Ides of March in 44 BC, the defenders of the Republic assassinate Caesar, savagely stabbing him to death. His death, however, only gives rise to chaos and the monarchy they so dread. The assassination of Julius Caesar really is, in many ways, a, a sad thing, not only because he died, but because it brought simply another cycle of violence and civil war. It was inevitable that a monarchy would follow upon the career of Caesar. What was not obvious was who it would be. Out of the smoke of civil war comes a frail 19-year-old boy. His given name is Gaius Octavius. But as Caesar Augustus, he would become the first emperor of Rome. This fellow Augustus, who started out as a teenager, really grandnephew of Caesar, and rose to power by a series of very ruthless and clever moves. When he became emperor, he realized from growing up around Julius Caesar that this gladiatorial stuff had tremendous political sway and influence. Augustus molds the gladiatorial games into a massive imperial industry meant to demonstrate the glory of the empire. 
while satiating the bloodlust of the Roman mob. Augustus created for himself, I think, a much larger gladiatorial organization, and it spread from Rome into the provinces. Augustus also founds the first of three imperial schools for gladiators within the walls of Rome and sponsors numerous games during the more than 150 days of religious and cultural festivals held each year. Augustus boasts of having put on some eight shows with a total of something like 10,000 gladiators in combat uh, and a number of, of beast fights with something like 3,500 beasts being killed uh, for show. Augustus rules for nearly half a century, the beginning of an era known as the Pax Romana. Yet the peace of Rome would not stem the flow of bloody games. Caligula, perhaps the cruelest of all Roman emperors, is a rabid fan of the gladiatorial games. He greatly increases spending on all kinds of spectacular entertainment. In comes Caligula, spending money uh, splash games, lots of blood. The initial years with Caligula, uh, the people loved him. They thought he was a breath of fresh air until they realized that he was essentially wacko. Caligula is so obsessed with the games, he regularly appears at state occasions wearing gladiatorial armor. The Roman elite are shocked that the emperor would debase himself by donning the guise of a slave. Caligula did not know how to behave. He forces people to fight to the death who ought not be forced to fight to the death. He drags people out of the stands and has them killed in front of others for being impolite. At one of his gladiatorial contests, when the crowd disagrees with him over the death of a fallen gladiator, Caligula is heard to remark, I wish the Roman people had but a single neck. Ironically, Caligula is assassinated after attending a gladiatorial match in 41 AD. But his reign of cruelty would only be taken up by his successor, the Emperor Claudius. Claudius is said to take great pleasure in watching the faces of his gladiators as they die. In an effort to feed the teeming masses of Rome, Claudius takes on huge civil engineering projects, building aqueducts and granaries. In 52 AD, he makes plans to drain the Fucine Lake. It was apparently kind of a marshy area, and people wanted to reuse that land for agricultural purposes. But before he drained it, he decided, hey, let's hold this great naval spectacle. Called a nomachy, they are perhaps the most spectacular of Roman spectacles. And what it represents is a mock battle, a recreation of some battle on sea from antiquity, but with real death. A hundred warships are brought in from the port at Ostia. 19,000 condemned prisoners are put aboard and given weapons. Surrounding the lake, units of the Praetorian Guard, the emperor's elite troops, prevent any escape. But as the battle is about to start, a band of doomed men greet the emperor with words that would echo through time. Hail Caesar! We who are about to die salute you! Disbelieving their honorable intent, Claudius replies, or maybe not. But his offhand remark is taken as mockery, and the men refuse to fight. Claudius, who had with him his imperial guard, threatened to shoot at them with his artillery uh, until they would go back into action. I think they probably figured that they had a better chance of surviving fighting each other than they did being sunk by the imperial guard. Out of the 19,000 men, only about 100 survived the battle. Claudius's lavish gladiatorial spectacles are scaled back by his successor, Nero, but Rome finds a new entertainment in the mass executions of members of the religious cult known as Christianity. What he put upon those Christians were in fact uh, pre-existing Roman punishments called summa supplicia, aggravated deaths for the worst kind of criminals. Blamed by Nero for the great fire of 64 AD that destroys two thirds of Rome, Christians face torture, crucifixion, and burning at the stake. But by far the most 
popular form of execution with the Roman crowds is exposure to wild beasts. They wanted these victims abused. They wanted them mauled. They wanted them bloody. They wanted them ripped up. It wasn't to kill them. They had somebody come along and sort of slit their throats later on. Although Nero goes down in the history books as the vicious persecutor of the Christians, he is, in fact, far more interested in theater and music than in bloody spectacles. It would take another emperor more than a century after Nero to reach the heights of depravity in the arena. In 68 AD, the Roman Senate declares the emperor Nero a traitor for his flagrant mismanagement of the state. Nero commits suicide, and Rome is once again plunged into civil war. The Flavian Revolt, a year later, brings a new emperor to power, Vespasian, and Rome's gladiators have a hand in choosing him. In the Civil War of 69, gladiators are found on both sides supporting various claimants to the throne because, of course, gladiators are significant figures in society. They don't see the crowd as their enemies. They're their fans. And when there's a fight, they're going to fight with them. In 72 AD, Vespasian begins construction on the greatest monument to death in Rome's vast empire, the Flavian Amphitheater, known today as the Colosseum. It would take eight years to build and serve as Rome's main venue for gladiatorial combat for the next four centuries. The inspiration for building an enormous amphitheater came to Vespasian as part of his popular outreach. He really wants to endear himself to a potentially skeptical audience in Rome. It's like a new president coming in wanting to lower taxes or whatever. It will get them off to a good start and counter the image that Nero had left behind. Capable of holding as many as 50,000 spectators and shaded by an enormous canopy, its seating reflects the stratification of Roman society. But it is beneath the arena floor that magic is created. The substructures under the Flavian Arena would be used for special effects, uh, to enable scenery to suddenly pop up in the middle of a show, uh, to enable animals to jump out at unusual times in the, the combat, uh, to allow the spectacle to advance to a much higher level than had been seen before. Its elaborate decoration and intricate equipment make the Flavian Amphitheater a visual delight for the Roman masses. But this stone stadium is really just a vast machine for the public slaughter of people and animals. A typical day of entertainments in the Flavian Amphitheater begins with the Venationes, the wild animal hunts. Specially trained gladiators called bestiarii fight wild bears, lions, and bulls. Ordinarily, beast hunters and gladiators were separated off. And these are, of course, two very different skills. The skills you need to stab a bear are very different from what you need to fight with a man with a sword. So popular are the beast hunts that an empire-wide importing industry is born to bring new and exotic animals into the arena. From all over the known world come tigers and giraffes, antelope and ostriches. The more bizarre the animal, the better. And the numbers are staggering. At the opening ceremonies of the Flavian Amphitheater in 80 AD, given by the Emperor Titus, 9,000 animals are butchered over the course of 100 days. But the meat of these animals does not go to waste. Much is given away in lotteries held during intermissions in the day's entertainments. At noon, the Meridiani, the midday executions of criminals and Christians are held. This is when there were no holds barred, where animals or gladiators, uh, armed with all the vicious weaponry at their control, uh, would do away with those who were enemies of the Roman state. A little later in the afternoon is star time. This is the, 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 the main show, and that's the gladiatorial fights. And these would be the elite gladiators. They enter the arena in a grand procession, displaying their weapons and armor for the cheering crowd.
Individual bouts are often refereed by lanistas, the gladiatorial trainers, who are charged with stopping the fight before a death blow can be dealt. When a gladiator is injured and cannot continue the fight, he holds up two fingers to the emperor in an appeal for release. If he fought well, he is usually allowed to fight another day. The gladiator combats normally were certainly not uh, to the death. Uh, what you have in gladiators is an extremely valuable resource, like a racehorse. You put money and time into this. You wouldn't squander it by having them killed uh, en masse. If a gladiator is especially courageous, the emperor might even grant him his freedom. The poet Marshall, a disciple of the games, records such an occurrence. As the struggle between the pair long stood equal, shouts loud and often sought discharge for the combatants. To both, Caesar sent wooden swords, thus valor and skill had their reward. When a gladiator earned his freedom, he was given a special award, a rudis. This was a, a wooden sword, a reminder perhaps of his training days, but also an indication that he never had to again fight with a sharpened sword for his life. If a gladiator's appeal is rejected, however, the emperor would indicate his displeasure with a gesture much misunderstood in the modern world. The greatest myth about gladiators, I think, is the myth of thumbs down. This gesture was invented for us by a French painter named Jerome, translating the word polyque verso, which means this. The Latin phrase polyque verso means thumb turned, and when you turn your thumb, you do it up which was the symbol for death in the Roman world. For those condemned by the emperor, death is swift. For the winners, life could be sweet. Prizes of gold and glory are their rewards. Some gladiators win as many as 50 bouts and become quite famous. Preserved by the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, Graffiti on the walls of Pompeii record the names of a few popular gladiators, especially one named Celadus, for whom the girl sighed. Romans are so fascinated with their blood sport that by the first century AD, a significant proportion of those who enter the arena as gladiators are not slaves by birth. Many are bankrupt freemen, destitute soldiers, women, and even senators. There are only a few instances in which Roman senators and, and Roman equestrians appeared on the, the sands of the arena. Uh, and every description of this kind of performance is, is dripping with, with concern and, and horror. But by far the most improbable gladiator ever to enter the Flavian arena is the emperor Commodus. I probably can't offer you a better assessment of the Emperor Commodus than the historian Cassius Dyer, who knew him, did. He said some people thought he was cruel, but that's not right. Actually, he was just very stupid. He is the son of the great Emperor Marcus Aurelius, a Stoic philosopher who disdains the violence of the arena. But Commodus is so enraptured of the games, he is rumored to be born of an illicit affair between his mother and a gladiator. In 180 AD, when his father dies of the plague, Commodus inherits the throne. But unlike his father, who controlled every detail of his empire, Commodus is satisfied to let others run the government while he indulges in personal vendettas and sexual excess. It seemed to get progressively worse, uh, more unpredictable, more outrageous. Even in the arena or watching the games, uh, he would take people from the stands, the spectators, and throw them into the arena. At first, his cruelty is tolerated, but all of Rome is appalled when their emperor steps into the arena as a gladiator. During his 12-year reign, Commodus fights in the Flavian Amphitheater 735 times. But they were fought with blunted weapons, and he never lost, which is, is impossible. So what we have are stage fights here where no one's going to give the emperor a hard time. Commodus delights in personally executing slaves, criminals, and cripples. At one festival, he orders all the men of Rome who have lost legs to war or disease to be brought to the amphitheater. Dressed as the mythic hero Hercules, 
he murders more than a hundred of the men with a heavy club. These men without legs were supposed to represent giants rising up from the earth to challenge the order of the heavens. And Commodus was there to ensure the cosmic status quo by destroying these threats to order. The climax comes in the games of 192. To show his contempt for the Senate, Commodus kills an ostrich in the arena and holds its bloody head aloft to the senators in the stands, indicating that he could do the same to them. But the emperor's plans are thwarted by a conspiracy of assassins within his own royal palace. The death of Commodus is one of the most dramatic stories in Roman imperial history. It was rumored that on New Year's Day of 193, he would produce a list of people he wished executed before the Senate and that this list had fallen into the hands of his chamberlain and his chief concubine, Marcia. They decided then to kill him. They poisoned his beef, and he became violently ill. But when it looked like he would recover after vomiting heavily in his bath, they sent in a professional wrestler who was living in the palace, and he strangled him. The reign of Commodus represents the apex of the gladiatorial games in terms of size and splendor. But the next 250 years would prove that even Rome's Christian emperors would have an appetite for blood. After the murder of Commodus in 192 AD, Rome experiences a dizzying array of emperors. In all, 35 men lay claim to the imperial throne. But through a century of political struggle, the gladiatorial games go on, a consistent part of Roman life. All the while, a force more powerful than the empire slowly takes hold, Christianity. In 312 AD, before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge outside Rome, the Emperor Constantine has a vision. According to the Bishop Eusebius, it is a divine revelation. About noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the cross of light in the heavens. Constantine takes it as a sign to convert to Christianity and places the cross on the battle standards of his army. His victory over the forces of Maxentius, a pagan claimant to the throne, makes Constantine the sole ruler of the Western Roman Empire. For the first time ever, there is an emperor who is a Christian, who believes in the Christian God and is influenced by bishops in his thinking. A year later, Constantine issues his Edict of Milan, making Christianity a legal religion in Rome. But it does nothing to stop the bloodshed in the arena. He was proclaiming religious tolerance for everybody, basically, so you weren't going to have Christians persecuted in the arena anymore, but those weren't gladiators anyway. So the gladiators continued well beyond that. So compelling is the violence of the amphitheater that even some Christians regularly attend the games. Gladiatorial combats, beast hunts, and even public executions continue well into the fifth century. Even Christian emperors had no trouble executing criminals in horrific way, pouring molten lead down their throats and this sort of thing. The official end of the games at Rome would come on the opening day of a series of spectacles given by the emperor Honorius in the year 404 AD. A Christian monk named Telemachus rushed down onto the arena and tried to separate the combatants. The audience did not approve of this action and started to riot. Deprived of their entertainment, the crowd stones Telemachus to death. Horrified by the display, Honorius formally bans the gladiatorial games, though they continue to be held for another 50 years on an unofficial basis. The last gladiatorial combat seemed to have been held in the middle of the fifth century, more than a hundred years after the legalization of Christianity. So Christianity itself did not put a stop to blood games. The Roman people, including many Christians, deplore the end of the games. Pagan Romans see it as an omen of dreadful events, and they are right. In 410, the armies of Alaric, king of the Visigoths, sack and burn the Eternal City.
Can we ever know what it was like to be a gladiator, to face death in the arenas of ancient Rome? Some find comparison in the modern traditions of professional sports like boxing, wrestling, and bullfighting. In fact, the Spanish bullfights are sometimes held in Roman amphitheaters. The allure is still there, the, the machismo, the, um, the, the, the playing with death that excites the crowd. The deadly violence that the ancient Romans considered amusement shocks us today. But are 21st century audiences really all that different? We haven't really come that far in some ways. The violence that was sort of hardwired into us at an early stage in our existence is still there at some level. And we've got to recognize that it's there, come to terms with it, but to simply turn our, our back on it and say, oh no, we're, we're moderns, we're civilized, we're so much better than those awful Romans, that's a state of denial. Ever since the Hollywood blockbuster Gladiator was shown in Italy, many Romans have been struck by something known as gladiator mania. Hundreds of normally mild-mannered accountants and clerks, men and women alike, have enrolled in a gladiator school in Rome. They learn how to fight with swords and other weapons from a master who calls himself Nero. Anyone making it through the two-month course earns a medal and certification as novice gladiator. To discover more about this and other topics, please visit our search engine at historychannel.com.